Um, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Brian Davis. I'm a principal software engineer at the Wikimedia Foundation, uh, where I work with the developer experience teams, um, trying to support technical volunteers, uh, whether they happen to be lucky enough to get paid like I am, or if they're like all most of y'all that are in this room that are doing it yourselves. Um, I use he, him pronouns. Uh, and today I'm here to try to talk to you a little bit about um, the cloud services ecosystem, uh, what it is, what some of the products and features in it are, and try to highlight some of the things that have, that have changed over the last three or four years that, that maybe you haven't noticed, or um, maybe you have noticed, and maybe you got some questions that when we get to the end. So, um, yeah, it's billed as a what new session, but I figured that we should start with at least a quick overview of like what the high level systems are and, and what they do for people, um, or most of them anyway. Um, so we've got kind of some, some foundational projects. Um, Cloud Services itself is a collection of projects that are hosted by the Wikimedia Foundation that are designed to provide um, platforms and services for use by the Wikimedia technical community. Cloud VPS with the, the cute unicorn up there in the corner um, is, is kind of the base of almost everything we do. It's uh, intended to be a stable performant hosting platform for the Wikimedia Foundation affiliates and community developed software projects which for one reason or another, and there's lots of fuzzy reasons why can't be hosted in the main production cluster at the, the Wikimedia Foundation. Mm -hmm. And Toolforge is a, a managed hosting platform that's actually built inside of Cloud VPS that's basically designed to help Wikimedia bots and web services uh, happen easier. And we'll talk a little bit more in detail later about how we do some of that. Um, Quarry, and another thing that I didn't put on this slide because I'm a bad person, Superset, are two web interfaces that, that we offer for um, accessing uh, SQL queries, making SQL queries to replica databases um, of the production wikis, and we'll talk a little bit more about the replica databases later. And then uh, pause is a, a web interface for creating documents that embed visualizations, graphs, code, all kinds of stuff. Um, it's a technology called Jupyter Notebooks. Um, unfortunately, not really covered in this talk, but cool stuff. So, And then uh, really the main thing that sets cloud services apart from any other shared hosting or running a computer underneath your desktop where you could do this stuff is that we have access to a lot of data from the Wikimedia projects that's that's hard to get your hands on otherwise. So we have the Wiki, Wiki replica databases, which are near real time, uh, usually within less than a second, updated copies mm -hmm. of the production media Wiki databases that run English Wikipedia, Wikidata, whatever, whatever projects are out there. Um, and these these databases can be queried directly from Toolforge tools or with those the, the Quarry and Superset web interfaces that I kind of mentioned briefly before. Um, Wikimedia Dumps is a, a project that produces um, archival copies of article content and, and other metadata from, from the projects. Dumps are available uh, over the internet to everybody, but we have some special access within the cloud services environment to make it easier for your tools to talk to the dumps data. Um, we have uh, a really neat thing actually that we don't talk about very often is the cloud elastic replicas. So we have a copy of all the elastic search full text indexes that are used to power the Cirrus search on Wikisearch. We have a second copy of all of that, much like the Wiki replica system in cloud services. And that lets people build tools that can do things like cross wiki search. Um, you can do searches with longer timeouts than we can allow in the production cluster because 
it's okay if things take a while to get done here mm -hmm. because lots of other people aren't piled up waiting for it. Um, and then the last thing I've got here up here is tools DB. Um, this is like a, a database as a service uh, product that's that's really pretty specifically focused on on Toolforge tools, but a lot of Toolforge tools need to store just a little amount of of stateful data, and so we've got a, a MariaDB database server that you can get every tool automatically gets credentials that they can make their own database schema within and, and keep track of data. And as long as you're keeping your data under say five gigabytes, it's all cool. You need more space. We've got we've got some other things that that you can use for that. So that was kind of the high level. Um, let's talk a little bit more about Cloud VPS, what it offers and what's new. Uh, when I say new, take this with a grain of salt. There's stuff that I'm talking about in here that, that goes back to 2020. But um, I don't know about all y'all, but my brain still thinks 2020 is new because something really weird happened and, <laughs> and I haven't really caught up yet. Um, You're not alone. <laughs> So uh, Cloud VPS is an infrastructure as a service project. Um, it uses software from, from a, a, a free and open source software project called OpenStack to maintain a semi-public cloud computing environment. Um, you can think of this as being roughly analogous to uh, AWS or uh, Rackspace or Google Compute Cloud, some of those kinds of projects. Um, but it's free in both the gratis and Libre senses for, for all y'all. Um, we provide compute, storage, networking for technical projects that are related to the movement. And um, we do this in part by customizing an OpenStack environment so that it's easier to share resources and responsibilities with other technical volunteers. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit more in a later slide too. Um, and just kind of give you a little sense of the scope of it. I've got some some numbers up here that I pulled a couple days ago from a monitoring tool that we have, but it's about 190 different distinct projects running within the cloud. Um, they're using 790-ish virtual server instances, 3,000, 3,100 CPU cores, and some kind of Kind of impressive numbers. I think the seven ter six point seven terabytes of RAM seems like a pretty impressive number to me. The disk storage number, if you work with big disks, like man, that's kind of boring. But but we got a pretty decent amount of RAM. Um, so let's talk about these are some of the kind of key features of uh, what Cloud VPS does. Um, so we'll start at the top there with uh, one of our customizations to the OpenStack platform is that that we have a, a system of accounts, hopefully a lot of you in this room have, um, called Wikimedia Developer Accounts. And we've tied that system into the OpenStack a API layer for both um, authentication to OpenStack and authentication within the virtual machine instances. And this makes it uh, makes it generally easy for anybody who has a developer account to join an existing project and the project maintainers and the developer don't have to worry about how to exchange what's my username and what's my SSH key and how do I do all this stuff? You just add people to the project and then and they magically get, get permissions. Um, other OpenStack components here that we use, we use a, a Horizon, which is OpenStack's management dashboard, dashboard. Um, our Horizon deployment has some some extra customizations again that let you do things that are unique to our cloud VPS service, like uh, configuring the puppet modules that are applied to a particular uh, server instance that you're running, or registering a web proxy if you're running a HTTP service and you want to expose it to the internet. Um, this is also Horizon's also where project admins get to add and remove users and uh, create virtual machines, manage DNS, those kinds of things. Um, next thing, this is this is one of the dubious news that the, the new OpenStack Cinder goes back to 
2019-2020, but um, Cinder is the OpenStax layer for managing uh, storage. And and we use it in, in our cluster both for uh, instance storage and also to make separate mountable volumes that you can move between instances. Um, in our environment, that that is uh, empowered by a technology called Ceph, which is um, the same open source storage platform that CERN, OVH, DigitalOcean, a lot of a lot of major hosters use. Um, and in addition to being the the back end for the the Cinder block storage, Ceph lets us lets us offer object storage, which is the Ceph object gateway there, which then you can get um, web interfaces that are compatible with both Amazon's S3 bucket storage system and with um, the Swift OpenStack Swift project ABIs. And those, those the 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 Swift and and S3 interfaces, those are actually relatively new. Those are like 2023 that we've exposed those. More OpenStack stuff. OpenStack Strove is a database as a service <laughs> project. So um, instead of having to manually create an instance and either hand set up MariaDB on it or use a puppet role to set up MariaDB on it with OpenStack Trove, you can just go to Horizon and say, I need a MariaDB database and it needs to be able to hold four terabytes worth of data and magic little computer gnomes run around and then they come back and say, okay, here's your database, go use it. Um, Four terabytes. OpenStack Magnum is a, a really new project. This is maybe the first time it's ended up on slides in a talk <laughs> that, that we're telling people about, but it's uh, Kubernetes as a service. So kind of similar to the, to the OpenStack Trove, it's a place that you can go in and, and say, I need a Kubernetes cluster and it needs to have four exec nodes that are this size and it's kind of complicated to set up, but once you get it set up, you push a button and the little magic software creatures go off and they make you a thing and then you come back and you hope that it works and does the stuff that you want to do for you. Um, Magnum, we're considering like a power user service at this point. So if you want to get into it, I'm glad to talk to you more about it you probably won't find the best instructions on the wiki yet because it's it's a little touchy at this point. Um, OpenStack APIs and OpenTofu. So in 2022, we changed a whole bunch of things so that we can actually expose the control plane of our OpenStack or the APIs for the control plane of our OpenStack deploy to the wide open internet. Um, before you had to like, do something to SSH and get in behind firewalls and in secret places. Now for my laptop at my house, if I have the right credentials installed, I can control OpenStack things that are happening in in the, the, the wiki cloud. Um, and one of the neat things that this enables is using this thing called OpenTofu, which is the, uh, the, the free and open source fork of HashiCorp's Terraform, which recently decided it didn't want to be as free as it once had been. Um, but you can use OpenTofu then to, to manage instances, Magnum clusters, actually. It's one of the really cool things for using Tofu for um, DNS, stuff like that from your laptop. And then maybe even more interesting is you can start to set up GitOps workflows where you can run uh, a Git repository on the Wikimedia GitLab server and use the CI attached there to drive the open tofu when you merge a merge request to activate it, call open tofu, change things in your projects, which is really cool. It's really pretty cool. Um, OpenStack Designate is a DSS service and we, uh, we have both internal and external DNS zones that every project gets. So you get some control and, and potential autonomy about how you expose your stuff to the internet. And then um, a whole lot of Cloud PPS projects run web services of some kind. 
And so to conserve public IP addresses and to enhance end user privacy, we've got a reverse proxy service that um, that you can use through that Horizon uh, dashboard or through Open Tofu to to expose your your particular websites to the, to the internet. And that's about that. Um, Toolforge. So Toolforge is um, like I said before, a platform as a service intended to make it easier for the volunteer technical community to create, run, and share maintainership of bots and web services. Um, Kunal gave a nice talk earlier this morning about some of the some of the history of that, and it turns out that we've been running this thing for about ten years now. Um, the the Toolforge platform, um, and there's some numbers here that are similar to the ones that were in Kunal's talk. There's about 3,300 tools. Um, as Kunal said in his talk, some of those tools are really awesome and big and have lots of pieces, and, and some of them are just little abandoned things that nobody's ever looked at. So <laughs> but the, the real number of operating tools is somewhat less than that number, but it's somewhere in reasonably close. And then we have about 2,600 people who are authorized to use Toolforge. That doesn't mean that they're daily active or monthly active or anything like that, but we've had that many people come and go and, and, a, and a large number stick around do stuff. So <clears throat> this, is, this is a little weird in a, in a what's new talk to have a big old slide about what's not new, but... Um, this this was a big deal in in Toolforge's history. Um, on uh, March fourteenth of of twenty twenty four, we shut down the the legacy grid engine service. And this was a, a distributed computing environment that that was provided from twenty fourteen until twenty twenty four. Um, Getting to the point that we could remove this was a big driver for a lot of the the new features that I'll be highlighting. Um, and it was also, I think, a big event for the volunteers that they use Toolforge. So I, I want to take a second to recognize all y'all that had to do work and touch your tools and fix things to be able to cross this this divide with us. It was for the best. Um, yeah, I think <laughs> I think in the long term it's all working out better. Yeah. But you know. Oh, I He's moving is never fun. People yeah, don't like it. <laughs> so now that grid engine is gone, Kubernetes pop bullet up here is is the only distributed workload scheduling system for Toolforge tools. Um, each tool gets control of its own namespace where the the tool can decide what and how to run, and we expose basically the entire Kubernetes API to you as an end user. Um, we uh, we don't allow arbitrary Docker containers to run on our Kubernetes cluster, and instead we have a, a collection of images that are maintained by by Toolforge admins um, for running bots and and web services in kind of the typical programming languages that our community uses: Python, PHP, Node, Mono, Java, Perl, Ruby. I think there's two tools that run Tickle. As their runtime, um, but then a, a really new thing, mostly 2023-2024, is is a build service um, for creating custom images. So this this was one of the things that we had to invent to be able to get off a of grid engine. On grid engine, you could write a tool that used both Python and PHP and had access to some image processing libraries and some special fonts, which was awesome. Except you try to put all that stuff in one Docker container and the world starts to get sad. So um, what the build service now lets folks do is is make a custom container that has the bits and pieces that they need in it um, in, in order to make your service run. And it's built on top of something called cloud native build packs, which are... Um, an emerging standard for um, one way to generate Docker compatible, OCI compatible containers. I guess we first started releasing that in 2022, my notes say here. And uh, my next note says 2022 also saw the introduction of the jobs framework. So the jobs framework is basically some um, 
wrapper APIs and command line programs that we've written that help it make it easier to start a job for one time use to create a job that runs continually or to configure a job to run on a timer uh, across the Kubernetes cluster. Um, for those of you that, that use things before in the grid engine, it's, this is roughly an equivalent of, of the combination of JSUB and CronTab for, for the, the grid engine service. And uh, the containers that can be used by that are, are either the centrally managed ones or images, custom images from the built service. Um, 2023, we introduced something called that we call the NVAR service or environment variable service. Um, historically, we left it up to every tool to figure out how they would bring secrets into the environment and keep them safe. Um, and people mostly settled on using um, permissions protected files on disk for that. And the NVAR service is, is basically just, we think a better um, evolution of that so that you can use um, kind of the typical 12 factor application pattern of storing configuration, especially passwords and secrets in in the uh, the runtime environment rather than persisting them in in files that you have to worry that you're not exposing to the bad guys web service is a thing that's been around for a long time uh, it's it's used to start an http service expose to the internet um, you can use either essentially maintain images or um, the custom images from the build service as as your runtime there um, the URL for your tools web service ends up being tool.toolforge.org, whatever the name of your tool was, um, which uh, provides with some benefits over prior systems where we were all shared under the same domain name. This, this lets uh, web browsers better sandbox and protect each tool from messing with each other. Um, and then that stuff also runs through a privacy preserving reverse proxy, like the one that we use in WM Cloud, which handles TLS, TLS termination and, and things like basic rate limiting. Um, Tools DB, we talked about a little bit before, uh, gives you managed databases. Um, it also has ways, uh, if, if you name your database schema ending in underscore P, that means you're making it public. So you can make databases there that your tool pushes data into that anybody else can see tools DB can see. Um, or if you leave the underscore P off, then only your tool can, can see the things that are going on there. There you go. So you can hidden facts. <laughs> All these years. I do underscore P. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Too public, many P words is a problem. Public the web now the Centauri. Yes. As of like two weeks ago. Yes. The underscore P data are available in Tori. Oh well. sick. Yeah. There, there there's a schema out there if anybody wants to go try to find it called S five three seven three four underscore underscore tool views underscore P, and that publishes uh, data on the number of successful HTTP requests to each tool is handled that are updated every time the log files rotate. So I think about four times a day. Um, it doesn't have the unsuccessful ones. No, we only we only track two two hundred and three hundred responses. The other responses don't get tracked in that database. Um, then there's some other stuff. There's a, there's a shared Redis instance that tools can use if they need to use light caching. Um, Redis isn't natively multi-tenant, so there's some tweaks that we made that try to make it harder for somebody to brute force enumerate all the data that's in there, but no guarantees that there's not a backdoor way to do that. So never, please never store secrets in there, please, pretty clean, yeah. in the Redis instance. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All the OAuth tokens are in there. <laughs> uh, that's, that's, happened. that's happened. Oh boy. Um, there's a shared Elasticsearch instance. This is different than the uh, Elasticsearch replicas from the Sirius Search. So there's a read write capable Elasticsearch instance um, used by a handful of tools. You, you need to uh, to make a request through Fabricator to get 
uh, read at, or write access tokens to, to this thing. Um, but like my stash bot bot uses it to, to keep track of a lot of stuff. There's a few other tools like that. And then um, dumps are exposed as NFS shares to this environment. Um, which can make it relatively easy for like bots that are working against dump files to use use dumps directly without having to download things themselves over and over again. I need to go faster. Um, so some more highlights. Um, these are some more new things that you can do. So um, on both the continuous jobs and web services now you can you can do what are called um, multiple replicas. So you can have multiple copies of the same process running in parallel. And um, this is generally used to scale up item potent things. Uh, for web services, it's usually pretty easy to scale up. For bot jobs, you have to be a little bit more careful that your bot's taking things in chunks that won't overlap if they're running two copies of itself. But it can be handy for making things go faster. Um, we have a new function in the, the job service that we are calling internal services, um, which is basically just a continuous job running on the job service that exposes a TCP IP port to other things within the tool forge environment. Um, so you can actually connect to these across tools if you want. Um, and uh, one of the things that could be done with this right now is that you could run a local Redis instance. If you needed to run Redis and put private secret things in it, you can run a local Redis instance within your tools namespace. Um, there's actually some stuff on, on Wikitech uh, talking about how to do that if, if you decide you want to do that. Um, and you can also do it for, um, there's, there's some classes of tools that have a backend web service that just runs an API and then a front end web service that they expect people to interact with. And this gives a way, if it makes sense for your tool to put both of those together in one namespace. So your front end can see your back end, but the rest of the world can only see your front end. Both the continuous jobs and web services now support a health check option, which can be used to help Kubernetes decide if your service needs to be restarted. Um, so for a continuous job, you can write, uh, it's a check is written as a shell command that gets run every second during job startup until the, the check succeeds. And then once the check succeeds, we're out of the startup phase. And then it's called every 10 seconds afterwards to just verify that the tool is still running and doing what it's supposed to do. Um, if the the initial once a second checks go for 120 times and never pass, then the system's like, yeah, something's wrong here and gives up, kills it and tries to let it start again. Um, in the once every 10 seconds check, if you get three consecutive failures, then it'll it'll restart your process. Um, it's a pretty neat thing. <laughs> it helps make, it helps uh, uh, get rid of a lot of people coming to IRC to say, can you restart this web service because it doesn't work anymore? If you can figure out how to figure out when it's hung, then the system can restart. Isn't the web service restart command do that for people? Or but somebody has to type it. So Max is saying that, that there is a web service restart command you can use to easily restart a web service, but some human has to go type web service restart. This is instead telling the little gremlins that we put inside the computers to go do these things for us. Um, so, uh, we've got one click GitLab hosting and one click fabricator hosting. These, these are things it's for quite a while. We've offered a way to set up Git hosting for your tool through the tools, admin org console. Um, and in late 2022, these moved to the GitLab code, code forge that we have now. Um, and I think it's a lot better. They used to be in Fabricator and they were kind of weird to use and the code review was difficult and there was no CI, but now we're in GitLab and it's mostly a pull request sort of workflow that a lot of people are used to understanding for doing code review. And then really awesomely, there's self-service CI attached. So you can you can set up your own you know, validation test to make sure that your, your code's doing good things um, before you get it all committed into your repository. 
um, I don't know, the, the fabricator project, kind of the same way you go to the tools admin and you're inside a tool and there's a button. Uh, my notes say since 2020, we put a button in there that lets you create a fabricator project for your tool. Yeah, um, some of us that are used to using GitHub, could you do like a really fast summary of why we'd want to switch over to using GitLab? Yeah, um, I think really the, the main reason is that GitLab is controlled by the movement. So when I have stuff and I, I have stuff of my own that's that's on GitHub and I wander away, the community doesn't have any way to take control of that same repo. Like you could you can fork and then go somewhere else and start start something new. The, the main difference in, in GitLab is that the community has control of that environment. So if we have like these tools repositories are set up in such a way that they're not owned by me or you, they're owned by the tools. So that lets us hopefully make generational tools that new new users come in and start helping to maintain and carry forward. I think that's that's really the biggest. Can I just, if I can just do a, a brief follow up? Um, we have also recently introduced some throttles um, on Jared GitLab and Fabricator um, because of recent uh, scraping that we've seen from cloud providers. So, if say you're running something on GitHub and you're running GitHub Actions and you're, tra and you're pulling something from foundation hosted uh, resources, then your traffic comes. Um, from effectively Microsoft Cloud with no way of determining that it is coming from GitHub Actions. Uh, so we will very likely get problems if, uh, if you're doing this, a lot of requests or a lot of traffic. Uh, this is not a problem with running GitLab CI, running anything on uh, cloud services. So that would be, that would be one of the one. Yeah, so. We, we let noise come from inside the house that we won't let come from outside the house. So basically, the short answer is. Yeah, 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 uh, that's a good analog. So it's like, <laughs> we, we have control this. Uh, GitLab so far doesn't go down a lot. And if it does go down, I know how to find some of these folks. <laughs> we can make put it back in. <laughs> <up. laughs> yeah, um, tool Hub integration. Um, so tools admin, uh, when, when you set up a tool, you, you can make a record that, that describes a name of the tool, a little short description of the tool, some keywords about the tool. Um, and those things then get turned into a, a thing called the tool info.json record, which, uh, comes from Hi's directory started that back in the day. Um, and now we have a, a thing called Tool Hub that kind of carries it forwards and extends it more. Um, so tools that you make in Tools Admin get documented in Tool Info JSON, and those Tool Info JSON automatically get imported into Tool Hub. So basically, your tools get published in a public directory where people can find them when when you set them up in our environment, which I think is a pretty cool thing. Um, Unwanted tools can be deleted. Another maybe weird thing to talk about is new, but it's relatively new. Um, not all tools are intended to live forever, right? Like some of them are experiments. Some of them are time limited in some way. Some of them are superseded by something else. Um, for a really long time, we just kept a fabricator task that was people writing down. I, I have this tool and I don't want it anymore. You can make it go away as soon as you figure out how to make it go away. Um, <laughs> In 2022, we finally got serious and we figured out how to make it go away. Um, so now in the in the tools admin console, there's a button called uh, disable tool. And you can, any tool maintainer, any maintainer of a tool can click that button or any tools admin can click it on anybody else's tool. And that uh, starts a process that immediately disables a tool. So it shuts down its web service, stops its running jobs. I think that's basically it. And then it starts a, a countdown timer that goes for 40 days. And then at the end of 40 days, the home directory of the tool gets tarballed up and, and shoved over in a corner and the tool gets deleted and goes away. Um, and there's a, there's a web service called 
disabled-tools.toolforge.org. You can go look at to see at any time what's in the in the countdown process that, that's been clicked. And then the last thing I've got in here is thin bastions with thin and air quotes, but um, I think bastions are maybe another strange thing to highlight because uh, it's kind of more of a feature removal than a feature addition. But um, when we took the grid engine away, that gave us an opportunity to to change what software was installed on the on the boxes that you folks SSH directly into. And we decided to try to make them have as little software as possible at the moment. Jury's still out on whether we'll be able to keep doing this forever, but it's working so far. Um, and the main thing, the main benefit that we got from reducing the installed software in the bastions is that we're hoping that there's a reduced contention for resources on the bastions themselves. So when the bastions had all the same software that the grid had on it, it was not uncommon for people, especially new people, to just come in and write their bot and start their bot because I'm just starting my bot, right? Like it's what I would do on my laptop. It's what I would do wherever. And when those things all ended up running on the shared bastion server, a very small number of resources got consumed by a very large number of processes, bad things ensued. Um, so, so now we're trying to make make it harder for you to accidentally run things on the bastions, basically. Uh, make it easier for other people to get into the bastions so that they can do things like start their jobs, stop their jobs, check their air lungs. Um, yeah, developer accounts and wiki tag. So this is this is very emerging new stuff. Um, there's a Wikitech became the tool that that we used to manage developer accounts really early in the history of of the cloud services project, um, where basically Ryan Lane wrote a bunch of cool software that extended MediaWiki to make it able to to manage an LDAP directory. Um, but as the the usage of developer accounts and the features that go with them and things have grown over time, using Wikitech as that management console became more and more obnoxious like it was just it was a bad fit so um in 2022 sres at, at the wikimedia foundation started working on on a thing um identity management service wikimedia idm that has now as of october 1st taken over management of all of the developer accounts so that's this is now the place where you go to create a brand new developer account to change your email address, to change your password, to set up a new SSH key. Um, so some of y'all will have a few bumps for a while as you get used to remembering like, oh no, I don't go to Wikitech to do that anymore. I go to this other place, but um, hopefully we've left the right help hints in, in, in Wikitech to, to direct you to doing that stuff. Um, and then making these changes has also unblocked a really long imagined change for Wikitech. Wikitech is in the process of becoming an SUL wiki. And right now, today, if you have a developer account that has the same name as your SUL account, you can squish them together and only have one account. If they don't have the same name, be patient. We're going to work on a process to, to, to get you to get you unified too. But um, I really hope this drop some of the barriers that we've seen about um, community collaborating on documentation around tools because we've put a lot of documentation about tools and the tools platform there in Wikitech. And historically, you had to have a developer account to edit there. And that provided a barrier to people who were high functioning users of tools who could tell things about how to do to them, but but weren't developers themselves, so hadn't gone through the process of getting this separate account. So. I'm really hoping that that will make some some cool changes for everybody. Um, that's basically the end. I've got a slide here about some of the communication and support channels for all of this. Um, we've got two mailing lists, Cloud Announce, which is an announce only, really, really low volume. If you're doing anything in cloud, please sign up to that email list. Please, 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 pretty please, please. Um, and then anything that goes to Cloud Announce also goes to the Cloud Out list, which is a more general open list where you can post your own questions, ask people for, you know, feedback on your ideas, stuff like that. Uh, we're on IRC, 
Wikimedia Cloud is the, the main channel where folks come and ask about cloud services and ToolForge, Cloud Admin. Cloud Admin is uh, where our SREs and admins hang out, and but it's it's an open channel to the public. So if you want to see how some of the sausage is made, poke your head in and see how the sausage is made. Please don't come there to be disruptive. I'll boot you out. Um, I'll boot you out real fast. But <laughs> tech blog is is a place where where in the movement some stuff gets written, and and there's been a few things uh, about cloud services we ended up publishing there. And then some documentation links over there. Basically, go to Wikitech from the front page of Wikitech. Hopefully, you can find your way in into all these things. Um, um, but there's a news section where we put like really big announcements, and then there's a Toolforge change log section, which is kind of more like the the minor the minor hits, things that um, maybe don't make it to the mailing list until five or six things have built up and then we do a do kind of a bulk dump. Um, that's my talk. Y'all got more questions. I'm glad to try to take some questions. Here's a credit slide. Um, slide deck, along with all the speaker notes, that's most of the stuff I yammered when you saw me just staring at the computer screen instead of making eye contact with y'all is up on commons and lots of things are linked there. So if I mentioned a thing and you're like, what is that thing? And where do I do that thing? Go, go check out the PDF on commons and it probably has a hyperlink and stuff. Okay. Hey, my question is, is there still a copy of the OCPF database for the tool? And then follow up is it yes, and like, like how well is it working or what, what like payments of like, yeah, that is a very good question, Kate. I think um, the answer is yes and no in that order. I, I think that might be correct. So we moved it to the MAPS project. I think it's still there, and I think it still gets updated. But the reason I'm saying thinking really like I don't remember anybody yelling about it being broken for quite a while, which maybe means nobody's looking at it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was just wondering. Yeah. Like, I, I knew that existed, and maybe now there's just like the Mac service, but hard, was it yeah, harder for users, and then it could be used by like more. Yeah, so I, I think the tile server is gone. Okay. I, I think DJ finally like threw his hands up in the air in okay. frustration and said no more tile server. I think the tile server is gone now. But I think the database replica is maybe still there. Um, and then I know that there's like some wiki mini atlas pieces parts that are around in yeah, that maps project. Yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, there's people have tools. There's here and there, like, there's community, but there's really good place, like, if you want to do that, or you want to use the database, like, keep on getting um, yeah. One more question more from the user, and uh, I see that the, the, the SQL uh, database queries live in, in, the in this cloud. Is part of database queries live elsewhere? Yes. And can they, is there any tools that can combine, like, you know, get me the, uh, you know, some kind of a structural data on commons from this directory, you know, and there's like a larger directory. I have a hard time combining the two. Uh, uh, yeah. Some kind of ways of doing that that you are aware of. I, I don't pet scan, but I cannot put a, can I put a sparkle square in the pet scan? If you can't, why not Magnus until you can, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that's that. Okay, Wikidata. But that, that does seem like a good question, and, and folks are giving you, I think, the right kind yeah, of answers. Yeah, it. Sparkle. It's under, under, under authority. 
Cool. So a tool space thing. I don't think open stack trove. Is it? Do you think it's the same block storage as the uh, sender? Yes. And you said you can request a Mario databases of size of three terabytes. I, I I don't know if I said three terabytes, but <laughs> oh, you did. <laughs> Yeah, you, you you know you know where Fabricator is. You can file a task. We'll we'll figure it out. Is that about how big IAs is these days? No, but it's it's getting a little hard to keep it within the five hundred gigabytes it runs in. We can. I'm pretty sure we can get you bigger than five hundred gigabytes. We can get you up to three terabytes. I can't. I can't say for sure today or not. It's just going off the old information. Yeah. It was still relatively new, and it was still very much a premium resource. Yeah. Yeah. We we get more storage all the time, which is which is good, because because you all use it up. There was some chatter about Ori being hard to maintain and wanting to replace it. Oh yeah, still movement in that regard. Yeah, I'm nervous about it. I like Ori. Yeah, I Ori rules. So I think the absolute most recent thing that I heard was that some people really like Cory and think Cory rules. So maybe we won't throw it out with the bathwater. Um, but it, it definitely has been, and it's been a thing since Yubi first made Corey. Like one of the first tasks Yubi made after he made Corey was find a replacement for Corey that we don't have to maintain. <laughs> and so that's kind of where the usage of Superset came from. Um, and 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 Rook has done a lot of work on on both Corey and Superset and on Pause. Um, but I. I think the most recent thing I heard from the team was that they were going to start putting a little bit more effort back into Corey because there were a few edge cases that they hadn't quite figured out how to transition yet. Beer gets giving me a kind of a nod like she thinks maybe I'm not completely talking out of my bum there. Yeah, I think we need to kind of evaluate what makes more sense for Corey and so what the CBD at this moment. I think one of the newer changes that's proposed for Corey is to start aging out some of the old data records. Because like right now, there's data results from 2016 that are in the results tables. So they're, they're, uh, they're forever. Yeah, and that's actually, people have realized that's maybe not the best thing. Um, for for a variety of reasons, sometimes for stale data reasons, but sometimes for right the state of on wiki data changes in such a way. Sometimes things get redacted and hidden, and if we've got copies of them that aren't redacted and hidden, that's maybe not so great. So there's they're going to start doing some some data aging. There's one thing in the query is that quite often, like uh, I edit some database query and then I want to go back. There's never going back. Kind of. <laughs> you know, like a, yeah. what before I broke it, what was it? You know, uh, yeah. so some kind of a, you know, like everything else has some kind of a history. You know, you can look at the history of the your queries. Yeah, Yumi was trying to make a wiki-like thing, but he missed that that yeah. feature, right? It, it, I think it might actually be that it's stored but not exposed except in the API. It, it's quite possible. Version. The results are versions. Every time you hit the next query, a new version gets. Yeah, the results definitely are. I can't remember if the query yeah. pages themselves are or not. Um, that would be a nice feature. I don't know. I guess I can put it on. Yeah, you know, you know where Fabricator is, right? I mean, <laughs> hopefully that's not where all ideas go to die. But if yeah. if they don't get into Fabricator, we probably won't remember them. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, so I have this uh, crazy project that I've been casting off a few people. But um, so if you if you suddenly for some reason you know Wikimedia decided to purchase a bunch of uh, fancy tensor processors for running. Yeah, we're not gonna. We're not gonna. They're not gonna. They but they they all require they super proprietary software. Okay. That's 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 basically like like we we have some. In the analytics cluster that uses, yeah, you like Taj. Taj would like to talk to you so, about this. <laughs> figuring out how to run workloads on AMD is not a well-worn path, and we don't have very many of them. 
if we figure that out and get better at it, then we can probably talk about that. And the reason is because it's children. It's, it's obnoxious, but it's just, yeah, it's too proprietary mostly. <laughs> Are we ready for lunch? We're going to have the best lunch ever.